Okay, so now we get into an area that's I'm um, a bit more confident about. I said that with some hesitation because my background is microarrays and um, just by the nature of it, it's a much more mature technology. I'm much more confident about giving people an, anal an analysis of microarray data. When I give them an analysis of sequencing data, I'm always aware, oh, I've done it this way, but I could have done it that way, or I could have done it that way, and I could have done it that way. So. Yeah, so, first point there, fast Q format. This has become quite a standard now. So, generally, you get the data, it comes off the machine in some kind of platform-specific format, and that gets processed usually into a fast Q format. Now, there's already several formats on that, we'll get into that a bit later. <coughs> In fact, we'll go through all of these in a bit more detail later, but let's just go through a workflow that I would typically do. So we start off with the raw data. We then don't take it for granted that it's okay, quality-wise. As Mark said, in fact, improvements in chemistry have made an amazing difference. I mean, just in the last year, although we haven't had, like, a big sea change in a way in, in the machines, but there's been a dramatic increase in the quality of the sequencing. So if you download some data from a public site like GEO in America, um, so I've, the, the data set we're going to work with is from GEO and it was generated say two or three years ago, the quality of it is, you know, if we got data like that, we would, at the moment, we'd say that failed, that is awful, you know, what's it looking like that for? But it's just the chemistry. The chemistry's have really improved so that there's actually hardly any poor reads in there. So we'll, we'll be looking at these plots. Um, might as well go through the bit. What we've got here, so the FASTQ format, so you've probably heard of a FASTA format, which is, you know, GATC for your sequence. You've got your sequence and, and then it's, it's the sequence. So the fast Q format is the same, it's taking the fast A, but then each base actually gets a quality score. So that's what the Q is, the Q for quality. Okay, so you've got a base and you've got a quality. And so each base that you sequence gets a quality score. And one of the, the main things we use quality to assess quality is this kind of thing. So in here what we've got is a 75 base pair read. So the read, 75 base pairs long. And when you start on the 5 primed end, the quality's the best. But then errors accumulate as the sequencer progresses into the 75 base. So quality tends to deteriorate. And just how much that deteriorates determines like is this poor and need some cleanup or is it okay to just go ahead with okay so and and these things are called box plots if you've never heard of them I'll just try and describe it so a box plot is a way of so for, sorry first take a step back this is position one and it's position one of all the reads it's the quality score of all the reads in the data set right so then we've got position two, position two of all the reads in, in the data set. So what the box plot is doing is telling us the range and the shape of that data. Okay, so if we go here, for example, so that would that position there is the lowest quality score we have for position whatever that 57. That position there is the highest. The little box in the middle is the middle 50% of the data. Yeah, and the middle one, the, the little line there, is is the middle point, so the median. Yeah, so it tells you something about the distribution of of the data. So often you hear people talk about a lot from a statistical point of view. You talk about a long tail distribution. What that means is the bulk of your data is sitting up here, but you've got a long tail of say poor quality scores in this case. Okay, so that that's um, can tell you something. So box plots are often used in, in statistics and mathematics just to describe the data. So is that clear? It, it is quite important because we'll be working with it. So if you've got any questions, if what I've said was not clear, I'm quite happy to uh, explain that again. Is that okay? Sorry, did you say 
say it measures the range and shape of the quality scores or what? Sorry, say that again. Did you say the box plot measures the range and shape of uh, yeah. the yeah. quality scores? Of the quality scores at each position. So that's what we're, we're looking with here, yeah. So, so for a position that's um, the upper and you know, the highest and the lowest, and then also what's in between. Yeah, so that that's our practical session. Yeah, it's just conceptually, I just want to make sure you sort of understand what that is, and because we'll be using it, this is probably a good time to make sure that you did understand what I said. Yeah. yeah so position one, that's the first space of all the reads, and then etc. Yeah. And then the quality scores comparable to those that you'd use in. So quality score of 20 to be a one mistake in a hundred or something like that. Okay, so alignment or mapping the as you, I, I noticed that Mark used mapping. I had mapping exclusively on my slides initially, but then someone pointed out that you can also call it alignment. I think people in the field tend to talk about mapping, but maybe alignment is more descriptive. Essentially, you're trying to... So like I said, you've, you've taken your sample, you've smashed it into tiny pieces, then you have to try and identify where that came from. Okay? And that procedure is called mapping or alignment. So you've got your read, and then you're trying to see if it fits somewhere in the genome. That whole area is, how do I des how do you describe it properly? It's a proliferating field and it's highly, highly complicated. The, the parameters that you have at your disposal when you run any bit of software, and the most popular software um, at the moment arguably is, is Bowtie, and we'll be using that. And I'm going to make you click on the options and you can just see the options that are available it's really really complicated and it's complicated because you're not only looking for a perfect match you're allowing as that, that question you're allowing a certain amount of error okay and the idea is that as we see errors tend to accumulate more towards the end so then you're being more stringent about how the mapping is working on the five primed end Etc. So there's all sorts of decisions to be made, and generally people will use the default because the people who've developed the software have been, you know, testing, testing their software and um, trying to settle on settings that work best. But it is um, we'll, we'll come back to that and talk about some of some of the issues that you kind of we need as as lay people almost like people who don't actually write algorithms for a living what we need to be aware of yeah but as mark was saying you've already got a platform to sequence again so you've got your human genome you've got your genome mapping is this thing of um, trying to place the sequence um, i might just introduce you to one or two of the problems so one of the things is, say you've measured, you've sequenced your, your, your reads, and you've got a read, say it's 75 bases long, and you're trying to map it, and it goes perfectly into two places. Yeah? So what do you do then? Do you just say, well, that's ambiguous. Wherever I put it, it's ambiguous, so I might as well get rid of it, or not consider it. Or some some people say, no, what we should do is is just, um, ran so if it could go into 10 places, it's randomly assigned it to one of those places, and through the, the run of the whole data set, you know, that all evens out. I, I have, my intuition is, if it's ambiguous, don't use it, but that's not the setting for, that, that's not the default setting for quite a lot of applications, and this is where kind of the limit of what I'm going to talk about because I'm just going to get you to the mapping stage and I'm going to do a very basic mapping. But ap depending on your application, whether you're trying to identify 
SNPs or you know doing an RNA seq or that you, you you might need to make decisions about that about um, what to do with an ambiguous read. Yeah. Then then another big area is what is called redundant reads. So as you see here, we've aligned reads and they kind of stagger, but then there's quite a few reads that are actually identical and they sort of pile on top of each other. And I think Mark had a slide about that. Now the chances are that if you've got a, a long big pile up of identical reads, that there's something error, some error happened there. Maybe it's an artifact, like a PCR artifact, okay, where something just repeatedly got amplified and if it's identical. So you tend to trust reads more when they stagger like that over. So you'd identify, for example, a SNP there when you had staggered reads identifying the same position. Yeah. And there's some applications like SNP detection where that's crucial. And so you might do a removal of these redundant reads. Yeah because you, you don't want to suffer that problem where there was, you know, there was just this, this artifactual uh, amplification of a particular read. Okay, so those are the main two concepts, and I think we'll come back to that depending on, uh, well, we will um, in, in the hands-on. And then, like I said, after that you get into the application-specific analyses. And often that involves what you see there, which is a browser view. And I've, I've added that as a supplementary exercise, so I don't think we'll have time to, to do that today, but I've made a file available for you to download and given you some instruction on how to use some public genome browsers where you can load that in, and so hopefully my instructions are clear. But if my exercises tend to be quite easy for you and you've uh, got through, by all means try um, start today and, and uh, I can give you a hand if you want to get to that point. But that's, that's always very good to see that because um, in some ways it's as close as you're going to get to the actual data. Otherwise you're just trusting all these layers of algorithms and analyses and all that sort of thing. But when you've mapped the data and then you make a, a track, you can see it on, on the browser and you can sort of see where these peaks are and it gives you some hand, some feeling. I, I think it. I think it's essential, actually, for for most applications, just to get a a, a feel for what your data really is.